the Garden of Eden, our most enduring legend, a story found in one great civilization after another. A story of seduction, the wrath of God, and paradise lost. But is it merely a fable? Is there evidence the great stories of the Bible might be true? Was there ever really such a place as Eden? Today, the search for the Garden of Eden leads us to a dry and desolate land, to a place called Mesopotamia. This is the land where the first seeds of human civilization were sown. And it was here that three of the greatest civilizations of the ancient world flourished. Babylon, Assyria, and Sumer. Among their ruins, the faithful have long sought answers to the Bible's most profound mysteries, while archeologists scoured these lands for the historical foundations of belief. Our quest for Eden is a journey back in time. First to Babylon, the last of these lost civilizations. Then further into the past to the Assyrians, fierce masters of the art of war. And finally, to a moment in the past so distant only Eden could have preceded it. To Sumer and the creation of civilization itself. The great arc of the Fertile Crescent. Over the course of more than 6,000 years, this rich land, cradled between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, gave birth to the first great civilizations. The Greeks called it Mesopotamia. We call it Iraq. By peeling back the layers of history here, we can trace the origins of our oldest stories and travel back to the deepest roots of faith. Our journey begins on the western edge of Mesopotamia in Israel. A chance discovery in 1947 would rivet the world's attention to archeology span and to the Bible. Two Bedouin shepherds are moving a herd of goats along the cliffs of Qumran, a few miles east of Jerusalem. In the sun-baked desert, they notice a small cave obscured by a rocky slope. Curious, one begins to climb it's not uncommon for ancient and valuable artifacts to be found along these bluffs. Inside the cave, the shepherd discovers the wreckage of ancient pots, leather scroll fragments, and some papyrus sheets all untouched since the time of Jesus. These writings by an obscure Jewish sect called the Essenes would come to be known throughout the world as the Dead Sea Scrolls. In surrounding caves, hundreds of ancient scrolls would eventually be unearthed. One of them would prove to be the earliest known version of the Old Testament 
including the crucial first five books, known to the Jews as the Torah. The Dead Sea Scrolls instantly became the focus of a tremendous international uproar as scholars and theologians fought over their ownership and their meaning. And the sensation was outstanding. This was described as one of the most outstanding archaeological finds anywhere. So they're very precious to the Jews because they're Jewish. It come from a very crucial period in Jewish history. They are very precious to the Christians because they are contemporaneous with John the Baptist and Jesus and so on. So they are very informative, but beyond that, we have a great emotional attachment to this library. The Bible has always been a book read from two points of view, the sacred and the historical. A traditional Torah is always written by hand. The words are read aloud as the scribe writes, so they become a living prayer. And each Torah is considered holy from the moment it is written. But the historical accuracy of the Bible has never been so easily confirmed. It's an effort that continues to this day. Some of the books of the Bible are excellent historical books, as a matter of fact, the earliest historical books that we have, and quite accurate, because we have cross-references from other sources, and they are found to be most very precise. So they are very important. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was the most famous event in biblical archaeology, but it was by no means the first. The urge to explore biblical history has a venerable tradition. It's a search that began in the Holy Land, but would lead to Mesopotamia. Throughout history, crusaders, mystics, and believers have been drawn to sites where the great Bible stories took place. But with the arrival of the 19th century, a new kind of pilgrim sought to fortify their belief in the Bible through the infant science of archaeology. Surely, there could be no greater confirmation of their faith than to prove that biblical history was true. The first aim of the biblical archaeologists was to locate sites mentioned prominently in the biblical narratives and to see if any illustration of those tales could be found. To use the ancient pottery, the ancient city walls, the ancient weapons as illustrations of biblical stories that all of them had been taught from their childhood. Fueled by the excitement of early finds, scholars from all over the world raced to stake out claims in a kind of biblical gold rush. Competing British, German, and French archaeologists descended on the Holy Land. Teams of theological detectives digging for both God and country. The prestige of each of the European nations in the Holy Land was measured by the kind of biblical discoveries that they were uncovering. And one of the most intense diplomatic and political battles that occurred in the history of biblical archaeology was the discovery of the famous Moabite stone. In 1868, deep in the land of Moab, Bedouins of the Bani Hamada tribe stumbled onto a mysterious stone tablet buried in the desert. The tribesmen were no strangers to the antiquities of the area or to their value to Europeans. The first Westerner to hear of the curious black stone was the Reverend Frederick Augustus Klein. He immediately set off through the bandit-infested wasteland, accompanied only by a few Bedouin guides. Klein was a missionary, not an archaeologist. When he first saw the peculiar basalt carving, he felt a rush of excitement, suspecting the black tablet might confirm his deepest held beliefs. He examined the stone 
and made a rough impression of the inscription. It was in a language Klein didn't recognize. Back in Jerusalem, he sought help deciphering the stone. As news of the find began to spread, the streets and bazaars buzzed with rumors of a great discovery. The writing on the stone proved to be a Moabite king's account of a battle also described in the Bible. For the first time ever, here was written confirmation, etched in stone, of a story from the Bible, two sources for the same event. For the faithful, it was the proof they'd been looking for, concrete evidence of the Bible's historical accuracy. Many sought to buy the stone, but the Bedouins had reason to be wary. In the past, they'd been cheated, even robbed, by European treasure hunters. Assuming that anything so highly prized by Europeans must contain gold, they dumped the stone into a fire in an attempt to break it apart. As fire heated the stone, they poured water over it, again and again, until finally it exploded. They found no gold, and the stone was destroyed. The first archaeological confirmation of a Bible story, the first corroborating evidence ever found in the Holy Land, was shattered. The loss of the stone was devastating, but it didn't end the biblical treasure hunt. Now that the Bible itself was verified as history, it pointed the way even further into the past, back more than 2,500 years ago to a great empire ruled from Babylon to the very moment the Bible itself was born. The year is 586 BC. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, descend on Jerusalem with the wrath of an angry god. It is almost six centuries before the birth of Christ. The Romans have not yet even dreamed of empire. It is a dark chapter in the history of the Jews, while Babylon's fierce star is rising. The Bible describes the Babylonian attack. Homes are pillaged, King Solomon's temple is set ablaze and utterly destroyed. 10,000 Israelite captives, princes, soldiers, artisans, and scribes, all are led to Babylon in chains. The Israelites crossed more than 500 miles of desert, following ancient trade routes across modern-day Jordan, Syria, and Iraq to Babylon. In Psalms 137, the Israelites lament by the rivers of Babylon there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Broken and exhausted, the Israelites entered Babylon in awe of its scope and frenzy. Torn from the modest city of Jerusalem, they beheld the majestic capital of the ancient world. But somehow, the Israelites managed to do more than sing the Lord's song in this foreign land. They also wrote it down. If you look at any piece of oral literature, and then you write it down, you're formalizing it. You're immediately setting down a text which people can criticize, or can say, this is the truth, everything else is wrong. That, I think, is the biggest effect of writing down the Bible or the Old Testament. Today, the reconstructed walls surrounding Babylon are stamped with the name Saddam Hussein. But once the bricks bore another name, King Nebuchadnezzar. This was a land of many gods and pagan idols, an unlikely birthplace for one of the world's most sacred texts. Yet Babylon's great diversity and the exchange of ideas and knowledge must have been I would use the word devastating. It must have been mind-blowing. 
The Bible would eventually reflect stories and traditions from Babylon and even earlier Mesopotamian civilizations. The Israelites couldn't easily ignore Babylon's thriving culture and great monuments. Its temples were among the largest structures in the ancient world. Big public buildings, the ceremonial walkway, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar with its legendary hanging gardens, palm trees, the river. If you had walked through the Ishtar Gate, you would have felt the warfed. And this was deliberate. You were in the presence of something powerful. But on all sides of it was the city, the people, the commoners. Narrow, winding alleyways, rows and rows of small stores, donkeys braying, crowds of people walking, small, closely knit quarters teeming with life. And it was here, the Bible tells us, that one of antiquity's most extraordinary monuments soared into the sky, the Tower of Babel. For ages, adventurers and pilgrims hoped that finding the famous tower would prove the truth of Bible stories. One seeker who failed would write, No man durst go near to the tower, for it is all desert and full of dragons and great serpents, and full of diverse, venomous beasts. Medieval travelers claimed they had found the tower, this spiral minaret still standing in northern Iraq. But they were wrong. This tower was built 1,500 years too late and far from the walls of Babylon. Perhaps the most intriguing possibility was posed by Robert Caldaway, a German archaeologist. In the early 1900s, he discovered a rectangular ditch with only a few ancient bricks remaining. Many experts believe Caldaway had found all that survives of the famous tower. Babylon's great monuments made a strong impression on the biblical scribes. But her most enduring legacy, surviving to this day, is a Babylonian innovation far more impressive still, the rule of law. Babylon was the first civilization on earth to have a written legal code. The original carved stone is an astonishing relic. Lost for hundreds of years, it would emerge in the late 19th century, a stone engraved with one of the most important legal documents of all time. 1,200 years before the Israelites were taken captive, a Babylonian king had this stone carved with the laws that bear his name, Hammurabi's Code. These writings can be read as precursors to the legal code in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. In societies where knowledge and law is transmitted orally and dealt with orally, precedent is terribly important. When it got written down, the people who wrote it down had immense power. Hammurabi's code has influenced nearly every civilization since Babylon. Today, even some of its more primitive methods of judgment survive virtually intact. Hammurabi described a ritual called the ordeal, a painful, even deadly, test of guilt or innocence. In some remote Bedouin tribes, the ordeal is still practiced much as it was in the time of Hammurabi. In this rare footage, a holy man called the Mubashi will judge the accused by examining their tongues after they lick a red-hot iron spoon. These men have been accused of theft. They must submit to the ordeal or be found guilty by default. Family members look on anxiously as the young men prepare themselves for the painful ritual. Come on, son. Come on, son. Go. Push. Push the nuts. Five 
Water doesn't ease the pain. It's meant to cleanse and purify the drinker and to ready him for judgment. The holy man prays and then examines the singed tongues, seeking a sign from God. Only the Mubashi can divine guilt or innocence, and he alone will determine the men's fate. At last a verdict. One man is found innocent, to the great relief of his family. The other is not as fortunate. Declared guilty, he will be fined for his crime. The ordeal is an intriguing modern-day echo of Hammurabi, but his laws reach even more directly into the present through the Bible. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The Ten Commandments, the foundation of Thou biblical law. And yet, only the beginning of a complex set of codes and covenants central to the Old Testament. And in these laws, the clear voice of Hammurabi can still be heard. Hammurabi set down laws. He didn't innovate a great deal. He merely set down in writing laws which had operated by precedent for hundreds, if not thousands of years, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and principles like this, many of which are still codified in law today. But the Babylon that shaped the Bible and its laws had its roots in an even earlier civilization, one that reached its peak seven centuries before Christ. It was the brutal empire of Assyria, a place the Bible called a land bathed in blood. Deadliest of all Mesopotamian armies to sweep through the ancient world were the Assyrians. In the Bible, they are the ultimate symbol of bloody tyranny and ruthless oppression. A hundred years before Nebuchadnezzar took the Israelites captive in Babylon, the Bible tells us the Assyrian king Sennacherib attacked the lands of the Israelites. In the second book of Kings, the Bible says, Behold what the kings of Assyria have done to our lands, destroying them utterly. Assyrians were ruled by despotic kings. They believed in absolute power. Now, absolute power means control, and absolute power almost invariably is kept in power by military efficiency and might. And the Assyrians maintained an enormously powerful and efficient war machine. And on the walls of Assyrian kings' palaces, were the chronicles of some of their expeditions, written in vainglorious, grandiloquent terms. The Assyrians, they would take a city, and they would stack up the heads of the leading citizens outside the gate, or they would take the king of the, of the city and flay him alive and nail his skin to the wall, or something like that, but everybody did that. Assyrian power, symbolized by the royal lion hunt, lay in the hands of merciless warrior kings. Even the Bible betrays grudging admiration. Behold the Assyrian. Under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Ezekiel 31. When the city of Rome was in its infancy, Assyria was the greatest empire in the world. For more than a thousand years, details of Assyrian civilization were few. Even its great capital city of Nineveh was unknown to the modern world. Then, 
in 1852, these desolate ruins were explored by British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard. What Layard found here, in northern Iraq, was nothing less than the royal palace of Nineveh, an unspoiled treasure of Assyrian civilization. Tunneling like a miner through the earth, Layard uncovered great winged bulls and spectacular artistry, hidden from human view for a millennium. The world was stunned and excited by his breakthrough. Nineveh was another biblical city found, yet more confirmation of the Bible's historical accuracy. But the most momentous of Layard's discoveries was the great library of Nineveh, an extraordinary collection of 22,000 clay tablets inscribed with the cuneiform writing of the Assyrians. The only direct communication that we have with the people of the ancient world, really, is what they left behind in their writings. We can know from that what they ate, what their medical treatments were, what their family life was like, what their politics was like, how they viewed religion. Details of Assyrian daily life reveal a patriarchal society a world where commoners, and especially women, had little status. Every Assyrian woman, once in her early life, before marriage, would go to the temple of Ishtar, and she would sit on the steps, and she would wait there until some man came along and dropped a coin on the hem of her dress, and then she would go inside with him and do her thing, and that was it. Yet in this despotic world, there was a kind of justice. In marriage, even a wife had certain rights. A woman could specify in her marriage contract that her husband would have no other wives. She might specify that he could have all the prostitutes he wanted, but no other wives. But if ordinary women had only limited status, recent discoveries reveal Assyrian queens enjoyed great privilege. In 1989, the ancient palace of Nimrud in northern Iraq set the stage for a startling find. Experts called it the most significant discovery since King Tut's tomb, the treasure of Nimrud. While we were cleaning some of the rooms, we discovered that there are some indications for a vaulting underneath the floor. We took everything out and we tried to sort it. And we discovered that uh, we have here the bodies of at least two of Gilgamesh. The name given to paradise is Dilmun. It's a place beyond the edge of normal human habitation. That's how it features in the Sumerian flood myth. That's where the flood survivor goes to live. And there are other myths which feature Dilmun as a place where everything was perfect. Dilmun figures in Mesopotamian legend as a sort of Garden of Eden, as a sort of paradise, a place of verdant green and abundant water and cool winds and breezes. It is a place of wonder, a perfect place. Yet it is also home to a serpent. In the ancient epic, the snake steals away the flower that bestows immortality. And so, like Adam, Gilgamesh must leave the garden and die. The idea of paradise seems universal, but what is it based on? Was there ever really such a place? The clues point to an enchanted, yet very real location. 400 miles south of the ancient Sumerian city of Ur lies the island of Bahrain, a pivotal marketplace on the trade routes across the arid deserts and salt seas of Mesopotamia. Today, Bahrain is something less than paradise, but it was once lush. Once this island had abundant water and thus abundant life. Once, long ago, this was Dilmun. But was it paradise? By comparison to the surrounding desert, it would certainly have seemed so. There was so much water here that what is now a desert island bloomed. It was a garden bearing lush fruit. 
and there were people here who apparently led a blessed life. More than 85,000 burial mounds dot this landscape, probably the most in any one location in the ancient world. The ancient bones tell us these people were taller and healthier, and they lived longer than anyone else in the region. And in the burial mounds is one more astonishing clue, the remains of snakes, ritually embalmed at some lost moment more than 4,000 years ago. Here in Bahrain, we find the serpent, just as we found it in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and just as we found it in the Bible. Our journey back in time has crossed the lands where the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the ancient Sumerians once walked the earth. Is it possible to venture even farther to the land that conceals the very footsteps of Adam? Here, faith and reason must part company. We now know there was once an island garden in Mesopotamia. We may choose to believe it was paradise.